Hello there, thrill seekers. They're working on the gas, so I don't know what sort of noises and interruptions will happen because of that, but I'm going to go and do this video anyhow. So, uh, the other day, I'm not sure exactly why, but in response to one of the videos I put up, there were a bunch of comments about out of body experiences, and I thought I would, you know, see what I could say about out of body experiences because out-of-body experiences were part of my gateway into Zen so let me explain a little bit about that when I was about 14 or 15 years old I think I bought a book called Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe uh, at uh, probably Walden Books in Rolling Acres Mall or one of those places or B Dalton's or something like that and I got really into this book. I, I read it and it kind of stuck in my mind. It, and it was all about having an out-of-body experience. And, and Monroe claims to have gone to all sorts of different planes of existence in his out-of-body experiences. And if I remember correctly, in the back of the book was a little explanation of how to have your own out-of-body experience. And it had to do with like laying down uh, flat on your back and envisioning your soul or something like that turning around backwards so it was facing the wrong way like facing out of the back of your head or something like that and then you were supposed to be able to you know journey out of your body and I tried it but it didn't work so it didn't work and I didn't have an out-of-body experience and I just kind of forgot all about it I, I did read one other thing which is a book the Hare Krishna has put out called Easy Journeys to Other Planets, which I thought was going to be about astral projection, but it was more about uh, eating vegetarian food and chanting Hare Krishna, so that was a bit of a disappointment. Anyhow, kind of forgot about it, and just before I did this video, just uh, leading up to the doing the video, I decided to look up Robert Monroe, because I must have, if, if I read that book when I was 15 or 16, that must have been in the late 1970s. <laughs> so something must have gone on with the guy. And it was pretty easy to find. He's got the, he started the Monroe Institute, and they, I think he, he passed away. But he's got all these other successors there trying to teach people to have out of body experiences and all sorts of things. When I saw that, I thought, ah, yeah, that's what they do. I guess that's what people expected me to do once I had books out, but I feel like. Uh, Starting an institute and doing all that sort of stuff sounds like a lot of work and a, a lot of uh, work in an area that I'm not really interested in, which is the area of running an institute. You know, maybe one of these days, but anyway, you can come to Angel City Zen Center and sit with me. We're sitting in person, like fully in person, starting on uh, Saturday for the first time in a year and a half. Like, we were sitting outdoors, now we're sitting in the Zendo in person, so come and, come and join us. Anyhow, the point I'm trying to make is out-of-body experiences. So. I never had an out-of-body experience. Uh, a lot of people, when they read Hardcore Zen, thought that what I was describing in one of the chapters of that book was an out-of-body experience, but I wouldn't uh, call that an out-of-body experience. It was more of an experience of being everywhere all at once. <laughs> You know, this is a, it's very hard to describe, and, and I, I feel silly even describing it, but it's a, it's a real thing. So it was, it was that uh, experience of, of encompassing everything all at once, not just kind of floating outside of this body and going somewhere else. Anyhow, the, the point I'm trying to make, which I, I promise I'll get around to, sorry, I had to look something up on the phone thing, is that, uh, okay, in response to one of the comments about out-of-body experiences, OBE, some commenter put this. There's some fairly credible expl explanations of OBE from a scientific viewpoint, and all of them pretty much point out that it's an experience. It's no evidence of existence of a consciousness beyond the body. No body, no OBE, essentially. Doesn't mean that an OBE experience cannot feel very real and convincing. It just means that what you experience during an OBE isn't entirely real. Now that's an interesting way to put it. What you experience during an OBE, an out-of-body experience, isn't entirely real. Now see, this is where Buddhism gets weird. And the reason Buddhism gets weird here is because Buddhism would say, yeah, sure, what you experience in an OBE, an out-of-body experience, isn't entirely real. And then they would say, <laughs> what you're experiencing right now in an in-the-body experience isn't entirely real. Nothing you experience is entirely real. You cannot experience reality. 
you what you are as an individual is is something that is incapable of experiencing reality experiencing having an experience that's entirely real well see this is the problem with words any way you put it is kind of wrong but let's let's just go with that for a minute now the other day i put up a meme on uh, what's it called what's that thing called instagram and it was by Romano, Ron, ah. and it was by Ramana Maharshi. It was a quote of Radama, Romana, um, Ramana Maharshi's that was made into a meme, and it goes like this: Try to realize that the body is not you, the emotions are not you, the intellect is not you. When these are stilled, you will find something else is there. Hold it that it will reveal itself. I like that quote. The hold it that will re it will reveal itself bit is a little, you know, of course he wasn't speaking English, so we don't know, or I don't know, what he actually said in, in uh, I'm not sure what language he spoke. I don't think it was Hindi. It was some Indian language. What he actually said wasn't hold it that it will reveal itself, because I, I doubt that he would say something like that, but maybe that's the best uh, the translator could do, because holding it, it, it's not something you can hold, so it will reveal itself. But if you work with a, a practice like zazen you can get to a point where you can kind of stay with it for longer but don't expect that to happen right away and don't expect it to be a journey out of the body i, I keep doing this because the picture on the cover of at least the version i had of easy journey to other planets had this sort of had this soul shooting out from <laughs> the top of somebody's head and going somewhere else that was the kari krishna book and so it, it's, it's not like that, but the point is the body is not you, the mind is not you. So anything that you can take hold of and say, this is me, that's not you. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a, another quote from another, uh, I keep you give, giving you quotes from Advaita Vedanta. Uh, teachers and I sort of apologize but I don't apologize because I think it's an interesting way to put it so here is uh, Ramesh Balsakar talking to a person named Jolene okay what is the truth the question Jolene really is that if everything is a concept is there any truth in life or phenomenality so so everything is a concept the body is a concept the mind is a concept everything is a concept that you can put into your head and your your uh, even your actual physical feelings if you dig into them enough are also kind of suspect you think oh i can trust that because my eyes see that my ears hear that my my skin feels that and so on but if you keep sinking deeper and deeper into it you find even that is questionable so where do we go from there and here's what he says this is what uh, ramesh says I go further in there. What I say, Jolene, is that anything any sage has ever said, Christ or Moses or Muhammad or Ramana Maharshi, anything any sage has ever said is a concept. Anything any scripture of any religion has said is a concept, a concept being something that some people accept, some people will deny. The truth is something which no one can deny. So on the basis that that cannot be denied by anybody, can there be a truth, do you think? According to my concept, he always liked to say that, there is one truth which nobody can deny, and that is the impersonal awareness of being. I am. I exist. That is the only truth which cannot disappear. For instance, someone comes, uh, some accident happens, he loses all his memory, all total memory is wiped out completely, and yet this will not be wiped out. He will forget who he is, where he is, but he cannot forget that he is. I am. I exist. That which no accident can erase is the only truth. I am. I exist. Everything else is a concept. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, it also kind of put me in the mind of another quote which I'm fond of and that I have uh, given you a few times, which is uh, from Mujo Seppo, which is usually translated as the insentient preach the Dharma, and this is Dogen. Uh, Nishijima Roshi translated uh, that title as the non-emotional preach the Dharma, but here's what Dogen says there. In the words of the ancient, the whole universe in ten directions is one I. I is awareness, and I 
interestingly enough, though Dogen would not have been able to make this pun because it's an English pun, not a Japanese pun, but I can also be the I, the, the, the I am concept, uh, so we can kind of think of it that way. Like I said, that wouldn't be Dogen's pun, that's mine, but it's, it works out very well. So that's what he means when, the whole uni when he says the whole universe in ten directions is one I. Furthermore, there are thousands of eyes on the tips of the fingers. There are thousands of eyes of right dharma. There are thousands of eyes in the ears. There are thousands of eyes on the tip of the tongue. There are thousands of eyes on the tip of the mind. There are thousands of eyes of the thoroughly realized mind. There are thousands of eyes of the thoroughly realized body. There are thousands of eyes on top of a stick. There are thousands of eyes in the moment before the body, the moment before this one. There are thousands of eyes in the moment before the mind. There are thousands of eyes of death in death. There are thousands of eyes of liveliness in liveliness. There are thousands of eyes of the self. There are thousands of eyes of the external world. There are thousands of eyes in the concrete place of eyes, right here. There are thousands of eyes of learning and practice. There are thousands of eyes aligned vertically, and there are thousands of eyes aligned horizontally. So this is a much bigger sort of I than what we're used to thinking of as I. So w when it comes to journeys out of the body, out of body experiences, so that circling back to that, when I think about that, I, I don't discount them. You know, I don't, I don't say, okay, that's not real. I, I think it's just as real as any other experience is real. Every experience is unreal to the Buddhist. You know, every experience, as far as Buddhism is concerned, philosophically and experientially, is maybe not the experience of being entirely real, as the person who left that comment says. So, an out-of-body experience isn't entirely real, but this experience I'm having is also not entirely real. So, I don't know the significance of out-of-body experiences because I've never had one, uh, not as such. So it may be significant to the person who has it to kind of change their minds about the way they think of this world and kind of shift them into another direction. But at the same time, when I saw that page, and all I did was look at it for 10 minutes, so, you know, God bless me for not knowing everything about it. But when I saw that Monroe Institute page and what has gone on with the guy who wrote that book that I liked when I was 14 years old, uh, I think, oh, you turned it into that, you know? It, that, that's the kind of thing where they, you try to solidify the experience and cram it into a box and make it a thing. And part of what Zen has been trying to do historically is to not put it in a box. And the way we try not to put it in a box involves being kind of circumspect and I, said, that's the word, I don't even know what the word circumspect means. You know, kind of talking about it in a roundabout way and never giving anything really definite and never, you know, saying, okay, this is the way it is, one, two, three, la di di done. It never does that. Zen never does that. And that's one of the things I really like about this stream of trying to work on this, that, that I like better than the Advaita Vedanta stream, which I keep quoting from and, and any other way of dealing with it that I've ever seen, because you can't, you can't just nail it down. And one of my big problems in, um, you know, American Zen is this tendency for American Zen to want to codify and nail everything down. And I think we're kind of going in a bad direction trying to do that, a lot, of, a lot of us who are working on this stuff. But there you go. That's just how it is. Anyway, that's my talk about journeys out of the body and out-of-body experiences. I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to help me have an out-of-body experience, I don't know how it will help me to have an out-of-body experience if you donate, but maybe, maybe if I get enough money I can buy one. But uh, I really uh, appreciate your donations because that is my only way of making a living and uh, that's my sole means of support right now. And uh, I, I really needed it uh, recently and that's been really nice that people keep donating. But if you don't have money, you, you get this for free. It's free. You just I'm just saying if you want to make a donation, you can and I really appreciate it. So that's the way that goes. So we will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. This is where you went, Ziggy, when the gas man was here. I'm sorry about that. You don't have to worry about it anymore. The gas man's gone.